Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Glee, for that introduction. So my name is Alec. Uh, I'm a current PGY3 here in the Department of Urologic Sciences. And today I will be going through a review of primary hyperoxaluria, discussing in-depth pathophysiology as well as current therapeutics and exciting preclinical studies. Special thanks to Dr. Lang as well as Dr. Forbes for their assistance with this presentation. <clears throat> so here's a brief outline of my presentation. And before I delve too deeply into primary hyperoxaluria, I want to set the stage with a case report. 40-year-old male presents with end-stage renal disease of unknown etiology on long-term dialysis and a history of calcium oxalate nephrolithiasis. He comes to his local emergency department. His primary complaint is a seven-year history of joint pain. On further history, he endorses blurry vision, painful skin lesions, and progressively worsening dentition. Physical exam showed a lack of incisors, presence of synovitis at the elbows, knees, and ankles, as well as deformities of the finger joints. Corneal calcium deposits were seen on slit lamp examination. Axial CT demonstrated nephrocalcinosis in the kidneys bilaterally. And radiography of the hands demonstrated metaphysial bands and calcium deposits in soft tissue. Biopsy of one of his multiple subcutaneous nodules showed biopharyngian crystals. This gentleman underwent genetic testing and he was diagnosed with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. Primary hyperoxaluria is a devastating genetic disease. There have been three primary types identified, that is types with a clear known genetic cause, which we'll delve into in the next few slides. Though rare, affecting between one and three per million people, this disease can be devastating. In its most innocuous form, you get recurrent nephrolithiasis. However, this often progresses to nephrocalcinosis, which in turn causes renal dysfunction. Then, as highlighted in our case report, the most devastating part of the disease occurs once renal dysfunction has already happened. Systemic oxalosis develops, leading to rapid deterioration and oftentimes death. pH types 1, 2, and 3 are autosomal recessive inherited defects in glyoxalate metabolism caused by mutations in AGT, AGXT, GRHPR, or hog A1 genes respectively. These mutations lead to the inability to meta metabolize glyoxalate, which leads to excessive hepatic production of oxalate. Primary hyperoxaluria type 1 is unfortunately the most common and most severe form of the disease. It's caused by a mutation in the AGXT gene, leading to a mutation in alanine glyoxalate aminotransferase, or, amin or AGT. This specifically leads to accumulation of downstream glyoxalate, which in turn causes excessive production of both oxalate and glycolate. Just to reiterate, this is an intrahepatic process. This excess oxalate builds up first initially in the liver. A total of 178 mutations have been found in AGXT with glyzine 170 to arginine and phenylalanine 152 to isoleucine being the most common at 30% and 11% of all pH1. I'll later explain why this is beneficial. pH1 has an extremely variable clinical presentation presenting as early in infancy or as late as the fifth decade of life. Median age of diagnosis is five to five and a half years of life, with earlier initial presentations being more likely to progress to ESRD. Approximately 50% of pH1 patients will develop ESRD by the third decade of life without early diagnosis and intervention. With early diagnosis and intervention, this can be delayed. However, unless the defect is in one of the mutations mentioned above, ESRD still often occurs. Even in those mutations, it can happen. Five classic presentations are seen in pH1. They're infants with oxalosis, approximately a quarter of patients, pediatric patients with nephrolithiasis and recurrent stone disease, and ESRD, approximately a third of patients, adults with occasional stones, a third of patients, recurrent renal dysfunction post-transplant picks up 10% of patients with pH1, and familial screening catches the last 10 to 15%. Primary hyperoxaluria type 2 is generally a milder disease compared to type 1. It has a lower risk of ESRD and kidney function deterioration is often slower. pH 2 is due to a mutation in glyoxalate reductase hydroxypyruvate reductase, GRHPR, which normally acts to catalyze the reduction of glyoxalate to glycolate. Because of the defective GRHPR, Excessive glyoxalate is produced, which ultimately becomes metabolized by LDH into oxalate, leading to elevated levels and results in pathology. 
PH2 also has a variable clinical presentation with median age of onset between three and a half to seven and a half years of age. However, it's been described as late as the fourth to sixth decade of life. Earlier onset of age will obviously lead to increased risk of ESRD, and about a third of patients with PH2 will develop ESRD by 40 years of age. Less is known about PH3 or primary hyperoxaluria type 3, as it's the least severe form of the disease and can be silent in some patients, or limited to simple nephrolithiasis. It's caused by a defect in the liver-specific 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate aldolase enzyme. The exact mechanism leading to oxalate accumulation in PH3 is unclear, although the main hypothesis is that the defective HOG-A1 leads to inhibition of mitochondrial GRHPR, which in turn causes increased glyoxalate and resultant increased oxalate. The less severe phenotype of pH3 compared to pH2 would support this, as cytosolic GRHPR is still present to mitigate the HOG-A1 mutation. In terms of phenotype, hyperoxaluria is still present in pH3, as well as nephrocalcinosis. However, end-stage renal disease is uncommon, with systemic oxalosis not being reported. Furthermore, for completeness sake, it's worth noting that secondary hyperoxaluria can occur from elevated dietary intake or GI disorders leading to elevated glycolate, which in turn leads to increased oxalate through the pathway seen. However, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to delve into it much further. Let's talk a little bit about history of primary hyperoxaluria. PH was first described as a clinical entity in 1925 by French physician Charles Lepoutre. After studying a four-year-old boy with calcium oxalate deposition in his renal collecting system and renal parenchyma, the possibility of pH as an inborn error of metabolism was noted in 1954, and the metabolic defect was then described in 1957. pH responsiveness to pyridoxine, or vitamin B6, was not seen until 1970. I'll touch later why this is really important, although the mechanistic reason behind this wasn't actually understood until 35 years later in 2005. And lastly, curative therapy in pH was first seen in 1985 with a combined liver kidney transplant in a PH1 <clears throat> patient. However, the first therapeutic approved specifically for pH wasn't until just last year. Let's move our discussion to oxalate itself and why it causes such devastating effects. Oxalate is a metabolic waste product of glyoxalate metabolism. It's primarily synthesized in the liver and excreted renally. It's important to note, oxalate is a metabolic end product. Hepatocyte synthesis of oxalate contributes to approximately 80% of plasma oxalate levels. The other 20% is made up from dietary intake. And as touched on briefly, high dietary oxalate can lead to secondary hyperoxaluria. High plasma levels of oxalate seen in primary hyperoxaluria lead to oxalate cal calcium chelation in the kidneys. These calcium oxalate salts are highly insoluble. And as described, at high levels, this can lead to recurrent urolithiasis, nephrocalcinosis, renal dysfunction, <clears throat> and then ultimately systemic oxalosis. Because calcium and oxalate chelate so well in the gut, the calcium oxalate salts are excreted through feces. However, if inadequate dietary calcium or high levels of ingested oxalate are present, then oxalate will cross the intestinal lumen and increase plasma levels through dietary or secondary means. Now let's move our discussion to glyoxalate metabolism specifically, because it's important to, to understand some of the new therapeutics, it's important to fully understand the metabolic pathway. Oxalate is synthesized in the liver from its main precursor, glyoxalate. Glyoxalate is a metabolic intermediary generated from hydroxyproline and glycolate. Glyoxalate is catalyzed by a variety of enzymes, some of which we've already touched on. Firstly, lactate dehydrogenase, which converts it into oxalate, and as mentioned, because oxalate is a metabolic end product, once produced in the serum, it begins to accumulate. To avoid this, other enzymes actively compete with LBH to break down glyoxalate preferentially into soluble or at least metabolically preferential end products. This occurs in both the peroxisome of hepatocytes and the mitochondria. Abundant alanine glyoxalate aminotransferase or AGT, which if you remember is the enzyme deficient in pH1, in hepatocyte peroxisomes make them efficient glyoxalate sinks, where glyoxalate gets converted into soluble end product glycine. This, in combination with the fact that the peroxisome is permeable to glycolate and glyoxalate, due to the presence of 
channel forming protein XMP2 makes the peroxisome effective at shielding the surrounding cytoplasm from unnecessary glyoxylate accumulation and resultant downstream oxalate production. Mitochondria of hepatocytes also play an important role in glyoxylate metabolism due to their ability to break down hydroxyproline. Collagen enters mitochondria and is modified through post-translational processing resulting in a hydroxyproline byproduct. This is then broken down into 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate. And this must be broken down further via two enzymatic pathways, which yield glyoxylate and pyruvate through the activity of 4-hydroxy-1-oxoglutarate alkylase, HOG-A1, the enzyme deficient in pH 3. The glyoxylate from the HOG-A1 reaction and from the glyoxylate oxidase reaction is then reduced further into glycolate via the GRHPR pathway and reaction, which, if you remember, is the enzyme deficient in pH 2. Any of the genetic defects in the normal oxalate metabolic pathway lead to an accumulation of oxalate, first in hepatocytes, but because oxalate is a metabolic end product, it must be filtered at the glomeruli and excreted renally. However, the body can only filter a half millimole per liter per day per 1.73 meters squared of oxalate, and beyond this level, renal crystallization and deterioration begins. Crystallization of calcium oxalate salts is based on a concept in chemistry known as KSP, which is the solubility product constant. And this is the equilibrium constant for a solid substance dissolving in an aqueous solution. It represents the level at which solute dissolves, or in another way, the level at which precipitation begins. Now, obviously, in urine, there are inhibitors that work against precipitation of calcium oxalate salts. But with such high levels of oxalate in primary hyperoxaluria, eventually crystallization takes place. This crystallization ultimately then leads to renal deterioration, which leads to worsening calcium oxalate filtration and deposition begins in the renal parenchyma, leading to nephrocalcinosis. This induces further interstitial inflammation and fibrosis, leading to progressive deterioration in renal function. Ultimately, it propagates a vicious spiral, increasing calcium oxalate buildup, and this spiral takes place in renal function. Once renal dysfunction is significant, a GFR at between 30 to 45, plasma oxalate levels rise and systemic oxalosis begins to take place. These images shown in in the uh, picture here, in a clockwise fashion beginning the right upper quadrant, show osteolytic lesions in a seven-year-old boy on dialysis, severe nephrolithiasis, both in native and then left iliac fossa transplant in a 38-year-old, skin calcifications in a patient with multi-organ oxalate dis, uh, deposition, calcification in the kidney in that same patient, and then a retina of a 49-year-old who was diagnosed with primary hyperoxaluria by an ophthalmologist after two failed kidney transplants. So how do we actually diagnose pH? Well, hyperoxaluria is obviously the hallmark. Urinary oxalate excretion is greatly elevated among pH patients, sometimes exceeding one millimole per day. Oftentimes, it can get up as high as four millimoles per day, where normal is a half millimole per 24 hours. All patients with clinical manifestations, i.e., recurrent calcium stones, oxalate crystals on urine microscopy, pure calcium monohydrate stones, nephrocalcinosis, or pediatric patients with reduced GFR need metabolic testing, meaning urine oxalate levels, and a referral to a nephrologist. Sometimes in patients with high clinical suspicion and normal urinary oxalate levels, renal dysfunction can be causing this normal level at time of diagnosis, which is present in 20 to 50% of pH patients. In these patients, plasma oxalate levels will be elevated, but only once this renal dysfunction occurs. Values greater than 50 micromole per liter are suggestive of pH. However, this is only used in the confirmatory setting. Definitive diagnosis requires genetic testing, and most reviews on the topic suggest initiating conservative and traditional medical management as soon as a diagnosis of pH is being considered to slow the ultimate progression of renal deterioration. In rare cases, variants in the AGXT, GRHPR, and HOG-A1 genes are not noted on genetic testing. And in these cases, a diagnosis of pH can still be made by liver biopsy demonstrating absent or reduced AGT or GA GRHPR activity. Some of the classical treatment modalities in pH include conservative treatment, traditional medical management, dialysis, dialysis, 
and ultimately kidney liver transplantation. Precision medicine, though, has altered this paradigm. Disease-modifying genes can be targeted, protein modifiers, small interfering RNA, and other new therapeutics are being developed. Conservative management of pH, though, has the goals of decreasing oxalate production and increasing urinary solubility of calcium oxalate crystals. The mainstay is fluid, fluid, and more fluid. pH patients need to adhere to an elevated fluid intake, three to four liters per day, to help promote solubility and keep urinary oxalate concentrations less than one millimole per day. Sometimes this necessitates the placement of a G-tube in pediatric patients to ensure adequate fluid intake. Traditionally, dietary change was thought to th dietary changes thought to reduce oxalate were considered irrelevant in pH, as the fraction of dietary oxalate increase excreted in the urine is often quite low. However, a 2018 study by Siner et al. showed that reducing dietary oxalate intake in some patients with pH led to reduced spot urinary oxalate creatinine ratios of up to 30%. Now, whether that's not an accurate test can be debated. Next, citrate compounds can be utilized, like K-citrate or sodium citrate. These work through four mechanisms to inhibit crystallization. Citrate alkalizes the urine. It complexes with free calcium, therefore limiting the overall calcium oxalate concentration. Citrate actively inhibits calcium oxalate aggregation, and it inhibits calcium oxalate adherence to the urethelium. And as Halson et al. showed back in 1983, this effect can actually be substantial, up to a 25 to 40 percent reduction in calcium crystal formation after treating urine with citrate. However, this study was done in healthy volunteers, so its utility in pH may be limited. Lastly, pyridoxine is utilized. This is dosed at 5 milligrams per kilogram per day and can be titrated up to a max of 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. If a patient is non-responsive, uh, meaning it does not experience a urinary oxalate drop of 30% or more, it can be discontinued. Otherwise, the patient needs to be on it like long. Pyridoxine or vitamin B6 is metabolized to something called PLP, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. PLP is the essential cofactor for AGT and has been shown to significantly reduce urine oxalate in some patients with PH1 because PH1 is caused by a mutation in AGT. The specific patients in which pyridoxine is effective are those with pH1 due to mutations of either glycine 170 to arginine or phenylalanine 152 to isoleucine. This is because these mutations lead to a misfolding of the AGT enzyme and therefore mistargeting of this enzyme to the mitochondria rather than the peroxisome. Treatment with high dose pyridoxine or vitamin B6 increases cytosolic PLP and can partially restore appropriate targeting of the AGT enzyme to the peroxisome. In addition, it increases AGT expression and AGT catalytic activity in the glyoxylate glycine reduction. Approximately 10 to 30% patient, of patients with pH1 will respond to vitamin B6, meaning a response of greater than 30% reduction in urinary oxalate. And these patients will remain on pyridoxine lifelong. Despite being utilized for decades, remember it was 1970 that pyridoxine first showed utility in pH patients. The first prospective study looking at pyridoxine in pH was not done until 2014 by Hoyer and Kuhn. It showed that in their 12 patients diagnosed with pH, that vitamin B6 given at 5 milligram per kilogram Q daily doses led to urinary oxalate reductions close to 30% in over half their patient population. Their patient population included glycine 170 to arginine homozygotes, of which all saw reductions, heterozygotes, and patients without mutation. <clears throat> the first graph shows the mean change amongst each of the subgroups, and the second demonstrates it on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, where solid lines are homozygotes, dashed are heterozygotes, and dotted are negative for the glycine 170 to arginine mutation. Unfortunately, though, even in the most ideal patient with pH 1, homozygous for glycine 170 to arginine, with traditional management, meaning aggressive fluids and traditional medical therapy, citrate and paradoxine, these can still produce progressed ESRD. However, it's unknown exactly who will progress and after how long a time. Progression, though, occurs in at least 50% of pH patients to end stage renal disease, meaning that dialysis is a cornerstone of disease management. Frequent short hemodialysis sessions utilizing high flux filters 
typically two to three hours with aggressive filtration, have been shown to be more efficient than longer, less frequent dialysis runs, standard three times per week sessions. And these can be combined with nocturnal peritoneal dialysis for maximum walk slate removal. This was shown by Isla Seol in 2006. Three factors influenced their recommendation. They saw early and excellent efficiency for dialysis in removing serum oxalate. However, they observed considerable rebound oxalate serum concentrations immediately after dialysis concluded, necessitating more frequent sessions. Then, as dialysis loses its efficiency throughout the run, longer runs are less useful. And finally, because rebound oxalate concentrations peak, then plateau somewhere between 9 and 12 hours post-dialysis, they suggested nocturnal peritoneal dialysis be added to effectively help with this process. Regardless of the exact modality of dialysis and the timing utilized if a patient is on dialysis, it is simply to buy time before definitive therapy, meaning true curative therapy, can take place. And in primary hyperoxaluria, transplantation, liver transplantation specifically, is the only definitive cure, given that it, the liver is the source of oxalate production. The transplantation effectively serves as both enzyme replacement and gene therapy. Often done in combined liver and kidney transplantation, which shows superior kidney graft survival compared to independent kidney transplantation. Harem Badeol found in their retrospective of patients with end-stage renal disease that of 68 children receiving either independent kidney transplant or combined liver kidney transplant, graft survival was 76% in the combined group at five years, compared to just 14% in the independent group, obviously due to ongoing high oxalate production in the independent kidney patients. Furthermore, the optimal timing for combined versus sequential transplantation is not standardized. As Ruiz et al. showed in their retrospective of 201 patients undergoing combined liver kidney transplant or sequential liver then kidney transplant, where graft survival difference was not statistically significant between the two cohorts. As we all know, though, transplantation is a morbid procedure, even in well-selected patients with significant operative and post-operative risks and requires lifelong immunotherapy, which has its own set of risks. This has opened the door for many new and exciting therapeutics. Current therapies that have shown promise in clinical settings take advantage of the wealth of knowledge that has been accumulated about sp the specific pathophysiology of pH. There are three key areas that these new therapeutics act. One, substrate reduction therapies. They allow the opportunity to treat metabolic disorders caused by accumulation of toxic substrates because these therapeutics directly target enzymes responsible for their production. For pH, this means the target needs to be a key step in the met oxalate metabolic pathway, and inhibiting this target must not have significant off-target effects. Next, chaperone therapies like pyridoxine have been explored. As touched on with pyridoxine, it works on the most common mutation in pH1, the glycine 170 to arginine, causing conformational changes in the AGT, which causes appropriate localization from the mutated mitochondria to the peroxisome. Chaperone therapies utilize small molecules capable of restoring functional enzyme conformations and assisting in lysosomal trafficking. Paradoxine as a small molecule chaperone therapy has shown a degree of benefit. However, other chaperone therapies like betaine have shown limited use. Lastly, another interesting area of therapeutics is in intestinal oxalate degradation. Through promoting enteric oxalate degradation, this can lead to decreased oxalate absorption and therefore reduced plasma and urine levels. The most exciting area of clinical therapeutics for pH is in substrate reduction therapy. However, first I'll briefly, briefly touch on intestinal oxalate degradation. The rationale for IOD makes sense. By promoting intestinal degradation, you can reduce serum and urine oxalate levels to ameliorate the pH phenotype. This is done in two ways, probiotic administration, thus encouraging endogenous bacteria, or oral enzyme administration. Naturally occurring bacteria, oxalobacter formigenase, thrive on oxalate consumption. Oxobact is a lyophilized formulation of O formigenase that showed promise in a phase one trial, leading to reduced urinary oxalate levels in 16 patients. However, Hop et al. in 2017 proceeded with a phase one to double blind placebo controlled trial in 28 pH1 patients that failed to show any difference in urinary oxalate levels after eight weeks of treatment. A follow-up phase 2-3 trial from the same group again failed to show any significant results. 
Oxalate decarboxylase is an active enzyme that degrades oxalate. It's typically purified from fungi and bacteria, and multiple formulations have been designed. One such is nephir from Synecoccus elongatus. A prospective randomized study of nephir in healthy adult volunteers demonstrated a 24% reduction in 24-hour oxalate secretion levels compared with placebo. However, again, studies in a pH-specific population did not show any benefit. While IODs are an interesting area of research, because they impact enteric oxalate and enteric oxalate contributes so minimally to pH, their utility in pH has been quite limited. The most exciting therapies recently made available in pH are substrate reduction therapy. Two enzyme targets have been investigated extensively in pH. These are glycolate oxidase, or GO, and lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH. Glycolate oxidase catalyzes the synthesis of glyoxalate from glycolate, which is the precursor to oxalate. Martin Higueras et al. demonstrated that GO is a safe target. They created knockout mice for GO, and these were demonstrated to have high urine glycolate levels without the presence of additional phenotypes. In contrast, LDH catalyzes the conversion of glyoxalate into oxalate, and Rakaheshi et al. showed that patients with LDH deficiency did not display a pathologic phenotype. Before going in depth into either of these two substrate reduction therapies, it's useful to note that while promising results are available, trial data on both of these is too immature to know if they can prevent patients from ultimately progressing to end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis or transplant. That is to say, it's too early to know if either therapeutic has the ability to cure pH or if transplant will still be necessary even in responders. The very first promising substrate reduction therapy developed for pH is a therapeutic interference RNA drug that acts against HAO1, which is the gene that encodes glycolate oxidase. It was shown in preclinical studies by Lee Boyle in 2016 to effectively reduce urinary oxalate levels in mice, rats, and non-human primates that notably up to 50% after one dose in a pH1 mouse model and increase urinary glycolate levels, as you can see in the two papers here. These two papers highlight at different doses the effective HAO1 inhibition on urinary oxalate and urinary glycolate. This led to the develop of, development of Lumasran, brand name Oxlumo, which is an HAO1-directed, double-stranded, small interfering RNA. It's conjugated to N-acetylglactosamine to facilitate hepatocyte uptake. It reduces levels of GO enzyme by targeting hydroacid oxidase 1 mRNA in hepatocytes. Lumasran has been validated through the Illuminate clinical program. The Illuminate clinical program was set up to study Lumasran, and Illuminate A is the first study in this series. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase 3 study that enrolled 39 PH1 patients greater than 6 years of age and preserved renal function. Its primary endpoint was percent change in 24-hour urinary oxalate excretion relative to placebo. Secondary endpoints were urinary and plasma oxalate levels yeah, from like over, pages. over six months. Patients receiving this drug experienced a 65% reduction in urinary oxalate. 84% of patients achieved 24-hour urinary oxalate excretion levels less than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. And patients experienced an average serum oxalate reduction of 40% compared to placebo. Illuminate B was the next trial run, and it was a single-arm open-label phase 3 study that enrolled 19 patients under the age of 6 with GFRs greater than 45, so pediatric patients with preserved renal function. Its primary endpoint were spot urinary oxalate creatinine ratio. Secondary endpoints were urinary and plasma oxalate, as well as GFR. I suspect spot urine oxalate to creatinine ratio was chosen given that they're pediatric patients and a bit of, it's a bit of an easier test to do than 24-hour urinary oxalate. However, as we know from other studies, it doesn't correlate well with urinary oxalate change. Regardless, Patients receiving the study drug experienced a 72% mean reduction in spot urinary oxalate creatinine ratio at the six-month mark, as well as 50% of patients achieved urinary oxalate excretion levels less than one and a half times the upper limit of normal. And lastly, Illuminate C is a single-arm open-label phase three that included patients with severe renal dysfunction, GFR less than 45. It was split into two cohorts, cohort A requiring not requiring dialysis at trial initiation, and cohort B, which was on hemodialysis. 
cohort A's primary endpoint was percent change in plasma oxalate and saw a 33% reduction. And cohort B's primary endpoint was percent change in pre-dialysis oxalate, of which it saw 42%. Taken as a whole, the Illuminate trials led to Masran becoming the first therapeutic specifically approved by the FDA for the treatment of PH1. In contrast to Lumasran, there is another small interfering RNA drug that has shown promise for pH patients through the targeting of LDH. And if you remember back to the pathophysiology, LDH is a very attractive target because you can theoretically impact all primary hyperoxaluries as LDH catalyzes the final step in oxalate metabolism, not just pH1, like geo targeted therapies. Nidoseran is an RNAi which, like lumasaran, is conjugated to N-acetylglactosamine, again to facilitate hepatocyte uptake. Upon uptake in hepa- into hepatocyte cytoplasms, nidoseran acts as a small interfering RNA to target LDHA mRNA, which is the gene encoding LDH, to limit mRNA translation and therefore production of the LDH enzyme. Nidoseran showed success in preclinical studies at decreasing plasma oxalate in animal models and was therefore granted rare pediatric disease designation from the FDA in 2020. This led to the phase one trial PHY OX1, which sought to evaluate the safety pharmacokinetics, dynamics, and exposure response of sub Q nidoseran in 25 healthy participants, group A, and 18 patients with PH1, group B. This trial ran as a two-arm, single ascending dose study. The primary endpoint was mean reduction in 24-hour urine oxalate. Group B, the pH group, experienced a 64% reduction in urinary oxalate levels, with 55% of patients experiencing a normal 24-hour urine oxalate excretion. The above graphs pertain only to Group B at differing doses of endoceran. After the success of PHY OX1, Dizerna, the company behind Nidoseran pushed forward with PHY OX2. This was a multinational randomized double blind placebo controlled study designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Q monthly Nidoseran injections over a six month period. Patient population was anyone greater than six with a diagnosis of PH1 or PH2, 24 hour urine oxalate excretions greater than 0.7, and GFRs greater than 30. Patients received two to one Nidoseran placebo. The primary endpoint in this study was the percent change in 24-hour urine oxalate. Patients receiving the study drug experienced a 60% reduction in 24-hour urine oxalate, and half of these patients achieved a 24-hour urine oxalate within the population normal by the end of the study. Of note, patients with a diagnosis specifically of PH2 in this study did not experience a statistically significant drop in their 24-hour urine oxalate, and the authors didn't really have an explanation for this. A long-term trial of Nidoseran, PHYOX3, is ongoing and set to conclude in 2027. This is a long-term multi-dose open-label extension trial designed to further evaluate the safety and efficacy of Nidoseran. Participants who completed PHYOX trials, as well as their siblings, were eligible to enroll in this one. UBC has been one of the clinical sites chosen for PHYOX3 trial, and we were specifically chosen because of our global recognition as a leading translational research center in stone disease, in large part due to contributions in the field from Drs. Chu, Dr. Lang, and Dr. Patterson. The primary endpoint of this study was to evaluate the effect of nidoseran on EGFR, with safety and tolerability being the key secondary endpoints. Other secondary endpoints of this study were 24-hour urine oxalate, stone events, and stone burden. Preliminary interim data in October of 2020 showed near normalization of urinary oxalate levels in all 13 patients receiving nidoseran thus far, without any serious safety concerns or issues with tolerability. And lastly, recently, PHY OX4 data became available, and in this trial, nidoseran was used in patients with specifically PH3. However, results were not positive, and as such, nidoseran has so far only gained FDA approval for PH1, similar to lumasaran. Now, we've covered therapies that currently exist. What about some future strategies for pH therapeutics? Well, there are three main areas that have been targeted for future strategies. They are enzyme restoration therapy, utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 for targeting, as well as targeting specifically of the inflammasome. Given that the majority of pH is due to defects in AGT, this makes for an appealing target for enzyme restoration. 
Enzyme restoration therapy attempts to restore activity of the defective enzyme through differing means. Meza Torres et al. in 2014 utilized something called a consensus-based approach to develop a stable AGT enzyme with enhanced activity called agt Reen. However, they were unable to adequately traffic this enhanced enzyme into hepatocytes in vivo. Roncador et al. attempted to target exogenously created AGT to hepatocytes with the membrane-penetrating TAT peptide, which is a form of a cell-penetrating peptide. These offer interesting potential because they are able to transport large molecules through the lipophilic cell membrane while still maintaining biologic activity. However, the TAT-AGT avenue of research has been limited in clinical applications because of the strong immunogenicity of the TAT peptide in vivo. A very exciting avenue of enzyme replacement therapy that has shown some promise is the use of AGT delivery through complementary DNA. Salido AL utilized an adeno-associated viral vector, an AAV, to introduce human AGXT into AGXT knockout mice. The above graph is looking at males in graph A and females in graph B, injected with differing doses of their AAV AGXT where GFP or green fluorescent protein is the control. As the graphic shows, they were able to reduce serum oxalate levels in all mice injected with just a single dose of the AAV viral vector. However, in female mice, graph B, at the lowest dose, this change was not significant. CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing is being utilized in countless diseases since its development in 2012 and subsequent Nobel Prize for its pioneers in 2020. As of 2021, there were 20 phase one or two trials active that utilized its technology for single gene disorders. So attempting it for primary hyperoxaluria seems kind of like a no-brainer. The benefit of CRISPR is that it would create a permanent effect given its gene edit compared to the transient effects of something like RNAi, like Umasaran or Nidoseran. However, this is obviously also a negative as it must be shown to be extremely safe before it can be utilized. Substrate replacement therapy Utilizing CRISPR has shown the most promise in preclinical studies. Zabaleta, Zabaleta's group had great success in delivering small guide RNA to target the HAO1, which is the gene responsible for glycolate oxidase and which is actually targeted by Lumasran in hog A1 knockout mice. Their most models demonstrated sustained reduced levels of urine oxalate four months after a single treatment with their CRISPR RNAi. The same group also showed success with small guide RNA to target LDHA, which is the gene responsible for the LDH enzyme, which is the gene targeted in Nidoseran. Lastly, one of the primary mechanisms that's thought to play a role in renal deterioration in pH is oxalate-induced inflammation and activation of downstream inflammatory response pathways. Multiple inflammatory pathway mediators have been identified in pH. One such pathway is the nucleotide binding domain leucine-rich repeat inflammasome, or NALP3, which is an intracellular sensor that detects cellular insults and activated release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. In a very interesting study by Knuf et al., NALP3 null mice were shown to be protected against progressive kidney failure and cell death compared to wild-type mice. They utilized treatment groups in two groups of mice, knockout and wild-type, and they fed each to a high diet of soluble oxalate to stimulate secondary hyperoxaluria. And the NALP3 null mice were completely protected to progressive renal failure, which occurred in all of the wild type mice. But most interestingly, NALP3 did not actually affect serum oxalate levels, creatinine levels, or BUN levels. So as the authors postulate, progressive renal failure is primarily due to the NALP3 mediated inflammation rather than any other deterioration. So that kind of comes to the end of my presentation. So in closing, I want to leave you guys with a few thoughts. pH is a devastating disease that in most patients leads to progressive renal deterioration, requiring dialysis, or a curative transplant. Conservative therapies are the mainstay of treatment, with traditional medical therapies like pyridoxine having the most effect, but only in select patients, and dialysis can still often be required in these patients. Transplant is the only curative treatment known, primarily liver transplant. Two new therapies, though, Lumasran and Indosaran, both small molecule RNA eyes, 
<clears throat> show some degree of promise. However, long-term data is not yet available. And then finally, there are many preclinical therapies that are in development. However, these are years away from actual clinical application. I would like to take questions now. Thank you. 